What's up, everybody? It's Professor Keegan, and I'm here with our final video lecture for the semester. Wow, we, we're making it. We're getting there. Um, yeah, so um, today I'll be talking about both Munoz's Feeling Utopia and a little bit of preparation for watching The Wizard of Oz on Thursday, which will be our final text for the course. Um, so before I get started with that, I am going to walk you through just a few reminders for the end of our class. The first of which is that I am still taking delayed work. So if you have um, discussion entries that you haven't submitted that were due after we went on remote um, instruction, if I'm still waiting for your essay, things like that, um, those really do ideally need to be into me by our last day of class, which is, is Thursday. Now, if you are running into some kind of crisis where that might not be possible, you need to read it, reach out to me and let me know what's going on. Um, especially with the essay because it is carrying a lot of value in the course. It's really important that some version of that gets submitted. It does not at this point need to be polished work, but submitted work is better than none. Uh, so please do reach out to me if I'm still waiting on materials from you. Um, and remember that I'm going to ask you to email me about that because if you just pump it into Blackboard without letting me know, um, I really have to backtrack in the gradebook and I don't always find everything that's been submitted. So please do kind of get on my radar by sending me a message about anything you're going to be submitting. Um, that can be either email or Slack. Um, also, we do have a discussion entry on the film for Thursday, so please do not forget to write and comment um, on Blackboard for our last class. I'm not pushing a video lecture to you, um, but I'm hoping we can have some good discussion about this film, which I'm assuming most of you have seen or at least highly familiar with. Um, I really love ending with something really uh, well known that we can hopefully draw new meaning from. So. Let's try to have a productive final discussion. And for that last uh, group four um, who's writing, let's try to give them some feedback on their work um, just to make sure that everybody's getting a shot at uh, participating equally in the Blackboard discussions. So don't forget about that. I have also posted our final reflection exercise on uh, Blackboard. So please travel over to assignments and take a look at it. That is going to be due on the 23rd by noon, which is the end of our final exam period, the scheduled period. Um, you know, I just thought that would be an ideal way to make sure uh, things get done in time for me to turn grades in, which are due by the 28th. So I don't have a, a ton of turnaround time. So if you are aware that this date is going to be a problem, you should definitely reach out to me so we can develop a plan uh, because GVSU has really, really crunched um, grading window for faculty at the end of the semester. So I'm, I'm not able to necessarily give you a huge extension, but if this date is a problem, let me know. We can work on it. We can work it out, work on it. Okay. All right. So I think that's all the, the uh, updates I have for you. And we are now in our final week of the course, and we are returning to Munoz, and we're looking at a section of his book, Cruising Utopia. So this um, this week is called Feeling Utopia, and we are entering into a realm of queer theory that, that really is only a decade old, um, a kind of utopian turn that the field took uh, right around 2010, uh, actually a little bit later, 2013-14, actually, um, when this book came out. So um, this is going to kind of add to our discussion of the antisocial thesis by moving us beyond some of those um, structures of thought and presenting a new way to think about queerness that comes from a queer of color perspective. So um, let's get into the piece. Um, first of all, I wanted to remind you that we started out class, the very first reading we did was uh, from Michael Warner's Sphere of a Queer Planet in which, in the introduction, he asks, what do queers want? And he says, remember, that this could be kind of the fundamental question of queer theory uh, in itself as a field, is, is to continue asking this question and trying to elaborate and articulate the actual um, motivations for queer desire. Like what kind, and he says, remember, it's not, just, it's not just sex or sexual expression that queer theory is about. It's about a whole other way of, he calls it practical social reflection, right? It's about a way of moving through the world 
Um, and so we can see early on in queer theory how theorists were trying to not limit queer theory just to the field of sexual desire, but a much broader set of, of theories about, like we've looked at, feeling, space, time, race, embodiment, um, phenomenology, right? All these other um, issues that are wrapped up in the construction of sexuality. So we started with this question. I don't think we've answered it. We've, we've expanded it, maybe. Um, and I want to connect that to this um, uh, epigram from Oscar Wilde that uh, Jose Munoz includes in Cruising Utopia and I also have on the syllabus uh, for our course, which is a quote from Oscar Wilde that says, quote, a map of the world that does not include utopia is not even worth glancing at. Um, and for me, what this means is that, you know, without the utopian spark, without the possibility of something coming into existence that had not existed before, without the, the, without the possibility of the ideal world, um, a map is useless because it can't actually transform us. It can take us around and around and around in the same space, but can it get us out? Think about Violet and Corky they actually seem to kind of achieve this exit from, from the known world at the end of the film last week, right? So we could say that Bound is a movie that does contain this utopian potential that the characters achieve by escaping from the sort of straight plane that they were trapped in. So we, we, we could think about every body of theory or every film we've looked at in this class as a kind of map, a map of the world, a map of, of what's considered to be real. And remember, queer and trans people are positioned as unreal in that world. So without a utopian um, urge or spark, you know, um, we're not going to be in a world where transformation is possible. And I think, I think Munoz is really drawing us to that kind of point when he includes this quote at the beginning of his book. So these are two halves of a kind of larger question we've been exploring all semester. Now, what is the piece we read? Um, this is Jose Munoz, uh, Feeling Utopia. Um, this piece is the introduction to his 2009 book, Cruising Utopia. It was 2009, I was right at the beginning of class. Um, and what's important about this book is that, remember when we spent some time in the antisocial thesis, um, a really important work we didn't look at, um, but that was part of that kind of antisocial turn was called No Future by Lee Edelman, and we heard Halberstam's response to Edelman when um, we did The Queer Art of Failure. Edelman's book basically said that queer people needed to reject the future and reject being future-oriented because the future was always a heterosexual project. The future was always kind of thought of as this like reproductive space that was dominated by the figure of the child, and the child is always characterized or thought of as a, as a, as a proto-heterosexual person, right? So he said, like, queers are always being abused in the name of children and in the name of saving children so that they can grow up and become functioning adults, right? Because there's this idea of, like, queer people being um, child abusers. Um, that's true even now with trans people in bathrooms, right? We have to, we have to, the child, the poor straight child or cis child is always the victim and the queer or trans person is always like the threat. So Edelman says we can't have this future oriented queer studies because the future is what he calls kid stuff, meaning it's owned by this idea of the child. Well, <laughs> Halberstam clapped back at that in Queer Art of Failure when he points out that child or children are actually very queer. Um, and along comes Munoz also, right, and says, actually, we have to reject anti-futurity. We have to actually build a future-oriented queer theory. Why? He says that queer theory must be future-oriented because being anti-future is very white. It, it's a very white lens. And the reason why is because white people are already guaranteed a future, most white people. And so it's very easy to say, ah, fuck the future. Um, we can throw that away. Um, it's really different when you're a, que uh, a queer person of color, a trans person of color, and your future is not guaranteed, right? Um, it's a lot harder to be blasé about futurity when it's not something that you can actually rely on, on having, right? So um, Munoz is intervening at the point of saying an antisocial thesis is actually a pretty white logic. We can see how earlier with this identification he was also trying to find a way 
around counter identification or identification as these kind of white models. Um, so he says, queer theory must be future oriented because queer and trans people of color are exactly the subjects denied futures under this kind of white lens that um, queer theory was like kind of activating. Um, so what Munoz is saying is that like, you may think that utopianism is naive because you're like a, an antisocial white person who just wants to say here and now is all we have, live for the moment, fuck everything else, right? Luke and John kind of style from the living end. But he says, you know, um, hope for the future isn't that naive if you were never guaranteed it to begin with. Like if you're still waiting for the promises of the Enlightenment to arrive, right? Like white people got those things um, at the expense of people of color. Um, and now white people are like, ah, oh, well, whatever. And, and people of color are still waiting. So he wants to articulate queer of color futures. What do those look like? What do they feel like? How can we sense them, right? Um, and so he wants to redefine queerness. He wants to um, particularly defend utopianism because some people aren't even in a position where the future they can access futurity yet, and we have to get there. He also wants to create what he calls an opening in queer thought through which we might realize that he says, quote, queerness is a being and doing for the future, unquote. So notice how he's taking the antisocial thesis and he's totally flipping it inside out and he's revealing its kind of implicit whiteness. And he defines this utopian practice against what he calls the pragmatic, pragmatic agenda of current gay politics, which is about what he calls the here and now. So basically he's looking at the the, the state of, of gay politics in, in the early or like late late first decade of the, of the 21st century and he's seeing all the calls for marriage equality and he's seeing all the calls for military service and he's seeing how far away from the liberationist impulses of Stonewall um, the queer movement had got, gotten um, kind of like gobbled up by corporate capitalism and he's saying like this pragmatic agenda of just getting what you can in the moment really does allow these systems to persist and it, and we need a more critical force against them which would be utopianism so he's he's creating this dialectic relationship between pragmatism and utopianism and he's saying like we've gone too far in the pragmatic way now we need to go back to this like more liberationist utopian style of thinking okay so i asked you and the blackboard discussions what you think Munoz means by his first line, queerness is not yet here. That's kind of like a pretty radical thing to start a book with, right? Like, that's a mic drop line. And I was wondering what you would do with it. And I did get a few people who submitted early um, that I want to share here. And then more people I'm sure will have responded by tomorrow. Um, someone wrote, the main argument that I took away from this article is the need for queer to constantly evolve. We must continuously realize all potential potentialities that are different from the present social and political climate and invade the straight spaces. Um, yes, I think here what you're noting is that, you know, Munoz is really concerned about the fact that queerness seems to be crystallizing into a normative formation uh, right around 2010. Um, and we see a lack of evolution. We see a, we see a, a sort of fixation of queerness in a certain way that's related to kind of this homonormative style of politics that was developing um, and taking over. And he's really concerned about what that does to the queer imagination. Um, secondarily, someone else wrote, I think what Munoz means by queerness is not yet here is that fully embracing that all queerness entails is simply not possible within the current state of affairs. In Cruising Utopia, Munoz asserts a very specific kind of queerness, one that rejects all manner of socially imposed boundaries and expectations. However, he laments the fact that the current progression of queer politics is steered toward a fully assimilationist strategy that attempts to conform rather than deny. It is for this reason that he feels that queer politics will be unable to progress further until this assimilationist strategy is done away with. As such, queerness does not currently exist in a pure form. What we think of as queer politics is merely an emulation of straight white cisgender politics wrapped in a rainbow cloak. Queerness is not yet here, nor has it ever truly been. 
what we perceive as queer politics is merely a naive delusion. Whoa. Um, I have to say, yeah, like this response might be a bit on the strong side, um, but Munoz is definitely uh, writing against the kind of dominant understanding of what we might call LGBT or gay rights discourse. Um, that was becoming very locked down into consumer capitalism, into like establishment politics. The nuance here, I think that's really important in this response is the fact that when this person writes, queerness does not currently exist in pure form and never has. And, and I think that's really key. Like Munoz is not saying we need to work super hard to achieve this like super radical ideal that we can bring into reality. He's saying that reality has a like a hole in it and queerness is on the other side. And in order to continue realizing the potential of queerness, we have to keep moving ourselves toward that space, but we will never actually access it because it's not something that can come into the world fully because it's prefigurative. It, it exists outside of the, the systems of meaning making that we have to make meaning with, if that makes any sense. Um, we can exist in spaces together and imagine a queer utopia, but Munoz argues that queerness is always on the horizon and is not attainable, right? That, that goes along with what we just noted. Munoz rejects the present and rather encourages us to look at the past to critique the present and imagine a future where queerness is attainable. I think Munoz is trying to provide hope for those who look at the present with despair yes, and cannot imagine a future where queerness can exist to its full potential. A queer utopia serves to motivate queer people to work toward achieving this queerness. Yes, I would. although I would say, caution, we don't want to replicate a straight line structure, right? Where we just work, 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 and then we get the thing. That's a very capitalist logic. I think Ahmed would also be critical of this as um, something that would lead us to produce straight lines. My camera has frozen. I'm going to just turn it off. Um, so uh, we don't want to we don't want to produce straight lines. We don't want to think about a linear temporality. Um, and so it's not that queerness is attainable as a kind of capitalist goal. It's that we have to let go of thinking it's attainable in order to move closer to like to move with it. Um, and I, I hope that makes sense. It's something you kind of have to feel. Um, in certain queer art and queer expression rather than maybe even theorize. Lastly, um, another sample, Munoz also argues for a queer feminism that focuses on queers of color. Again, this draws back to the idea that queerness isn't yet here because most of our queer brothers and sisters of color are left out of conversations, being an even further marginalized community. Um, absolutely, right? Like Munoz is also writing against this white lens that thinks the future can be it can be casually tossed away um uh simply because you know white people can kind of are kind of guaranteed that temporality whereas people of color can't rely on that so um what does uh munoz mean by queerness as ideality right and this is where i think things get a little maybe if you've not th thought much about what that term means um what he means here is that queerness is a way of basically realizing or, or coming into contact with over and over again, a set of ideals about how the world should be. And it's because queer people sense the world differently that we have this knowledge that the world could be different from how it is. It's that disconnect between what we sense and what the world um, treats as real that dissonance he says in that gap between what we feel and what the world says is real that's where an ideal can form about how things should be that's like a transformative dissonance right so it's a place where you can think of it like as a gap between us and the world where ideas collect and can, and can then be worked on and, and and made into culture and art and shared and so this is what he means when he says, put another way, we are not yet queer. We may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. The future is queerness's domain. 
Queerness is a structuring and educated mode of desiring. Whoa, wait, let's say that again. Queerness is a structuring, meaning it gives form to things, and educated, meaning it has, it has a certain kind of knowledge, mode of desiring or wanting things that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. That might be the most important sentence in this piece because here is where Binoz is actually defining, redefining queerness for us in this new way. It's a thing that it has, it has its own knowledge. It creates forms. It's about wanting. And it allows us to sense beyond what the world says exists right now. He says, the here and now is a prison house. Queerness is a longing that propels us onward beyond the romances of the negative and toiling in the present. Queerness is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough, that indeed something is missing. Queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and an insistence on potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. So here is where, I'm gonna see if I can turn my camera back on. I don't think I can right now. Um, Munoz is basically saying that queerness is about insisting that another world is possible. Simply through wanting the things that queer people want, we can start to imagine a different world where those things would be provided, right? It's through their very absence um, that we then begin to understand the world is not fixed and does not need to be the way it is, okay? So this leads to this idea of feeling utopia. Remember, an utopia is the perfect place and therefore the place that cannot be. Uh, Munoz says that queerness's main function is to help us imagine and maintain the feeling for utopian futures. So again, that gap between what we feel or want and what is provided or exists allows us to start imagining a perfect place where those things could exist which then allows us to start hoping for a future where they might come into possibility, right? So he's looking in this piece at different kinds of queer cultural production. He, he talks about painting, he talks about poetry, um, he talks about performances, um, all clustered around the period of Stonewall uh, around the late 60s. And he's interested in looking at how these texts express a utopian, what he calls not quite hereness. This quality of something is here that hasn't quite arrived yet, but we, we're waiting for it or we know it could happen. Um, and he says that if you look at the art around this time that queer people make, were making, you can see this kind of not quite here quality that's, that at Stonewall suddenly kind of just like flashed into historical um, temporality. Like, like, like Stonewall was the moment but the, the sort of like cultural conditions around that moment that needed to exist were there already, right? So it's kind of this utopian anticipation that exploded in this one moment of kind of anti-police rage that queer people suddenly, and it wasn't planned, right? It just happened. It, it was, it, it's what we call a coherent moment where things just kind of suddenly come into structure. Uh, he talks about Andy Warhol's Coca-Cola, this, this lithograph, um, as an example of this kind of art. And he says that, like, sure, you could have this Marxist analysis of Coca-Cola as this, like, oppressive capitalist consumer product, or, like Andy Warhol, you could kind of turn the object into almost a devotional um, object because it signifies a kind of horizontal, like, horizontality, right? Like, um, like everybody whether they're rich or poor, beautiful, ugly, queer or straight, everybody drinks Coke. It's like, the, it's like a democratic object. And in that is there, there was this like, this elegant kind of beauty, utopian possibility of like a society where everyone could be equal <laughs> because Coca-Cola is for everybody, right? So this kind of practice of paying attention to objects that signify a kind of demo democratic um, potential that didn't quite exist, but maybe could. Um, he makes a, a distinction, this is from Ernst Bloch, who he's drawing a lot of his ideas from, um, Munoz, a distinction between abstract and concrete utopias here. 
in that abstract utopia is function as a mode of critique um, where, you know, you could be like, well, that's not, this is a shitty world because X, Y, Z things are happening, right? And they shouldn't. Um, I We do this all the time, right? Um, but because they're not, those types of critiques aren't actually plugged into a, a sustained historical consciousness and don't have any problem solving potential, he says those are the naive escapist utopias. Whereas concrete utopias are forms of educated hope that are historically grounded and can provide the basis for collective organizing and revolutionary movement. And so you could think about like inbound, for example, we know that Violet is not happy in her reality. She wants to exit that reality and she probably spends a lot of time hoping or dreaming, daydreaming about getting out, right? Um, that would be abstract utopian thinking. But it's not until Corky comes along and Violet starts to realize that she could develop a plan. She could organize with Corky. You could think of Violet and Corky as like queer organizing going on, like queer collectivity under the surface. It's not until they get together that they're able to develop a concrete utopia where there's a plan. They can they move, they can touch and move and rearrange their world, right? Um, so there's a difference between like complaining about the shitty world and like doing something to, to actually shift those conditions, just to be clear. So Munoz is interested in looking at how queer expressions of hope for something else. Um, you know, queerness is the thing that lets us know something else should be here that isn't. There's something missing, right? Um, those feelings that there should be something else or maybe something else will happen can become organized liberatory moments. Like they're the sparks that can suddenly develop into political movements like Stonewall, right? And he's saying we need another one of those. So Munoz looks at queer art in writing as places where he caught what he calls affective communities of hope can collect and begin to organize. Like you can start to see queer people articulating the not quite hereness or the hope for something else um, in all kinds of artistic production uh, at different times. And of course, Munoz is looking at the late 60s. He says, in hoping we risk disappointment, right? If you, if you hope for something and it doesn't happen, then that hurts. But he says, lack of hope is far more dangerous because that leads us to abandon the question, the larger question of like, why this world and not something else? Why this reality and not a different one where um, more resources would be provided, like more things would be available, more experiences would be celebrated, right? So we have to keep hoping even though it, it can hurt to lose. Um, so he says that queer idealism can indeed be political if it engages history and proposes concrete utopias. And that's the key distinction that he's making between naive and concrete um, forms of this kind of utopian thought. So he says, queerness is valuable only in the horizon. And I'm wondering like what you thought that meant. Uh, for me, what it means, if you think about what a horizon is, right? Um, her, he describes queerness as being able to maintain a utopian vision as a constantly unfolding horizon. So the horizon is um, the point at which our perception fails. So if you look out the window or you look down the road, right? Or you climb a tall building, um, where you stop being able to see new land is the horizon. So it's the point where your perception fails, but you beyond which you still know there's something there that you cannot perceive yet. So the horizon is like this paradoxical thing where you can no longer see new things but you also know new things are on the other side. And if you continue to move, the horizon also moves, right? So the horizon is always the same distance away from you, at least on planet Earth. And, um, you know, the further, the closer, you can never get any closer to it, which is, which is paradoxical in, in its kind of construction. And so when you think about how the horizon has kind of haunted a lot of the texts we've looked at in this class, like for example, um, at the end of The Living End, uh, Luke and John are literally positioned in front of a horizon, right? Um, and you think about like 
what is Iraqi doing with this open space behind them, the space of potential, this space that seems to be where they seem to be stranded and can't access it, right? Um, the kind of sorrow and exhaustion in this image uh, is, is about the inability to access the potential that that horizon maybe suggests. Or we could think about uh, Corky and Violet. Here we have a horizontal shot of the truck and we know the truck comes right at us and then we get a black card. So this, this black wipe comes over the screen. Um, but this is also a horizontal shot that is pointing at a kind of horizon um, behind the truck and, and suggesting that there's a horizon behind us that they're driving into. So it's like a reversal of the classic sunset motif from a Western. Um, so we're supposed to imagine a horizon behind us that we can't see, which is an interesting sort of reversal of the classic use of the horizon in cinema. Um, but we know that Corky and Violet are escaping into this horizon. Um, so they have actually achieved this utopian exit from the trapped spaces that they were caught in, whether it was the prison Corky was locked in or Violet's marriage, right? Um, at the end of Finding Nemo, what we have is a kind of endless watery space that we gaze off into, uh, which is kind of funny. It's ironic because it says the end, but of course we're looking at an image where there is no end. Um, we have at, like endless receding space in front of us that signifies <laughs> like actually a continuation um, or which is, that's kind of a queer ending or we have right when you watch the wizard of oz i'd like you to think about the function of the emerald city on the horizon and what kind of work that's doing in the text to produce this feeling of utopian um, anticipation uh, and that's very different from what happens when they actually get to the city because um, remember, Mignot says that queerness has to remain on the horizon for it to be valuable. So what happens when you actually get to the get to the thing, and then it turns out maybe not to be what you thought it might be? Okay, so back to the question of what do queers want. And we're back to, uh, you'll remember that we watched Dorothy perform somewhere over the rainbow, maybe on our first day, right? Um, Munoz writes, queerness is that thing that lets us feel that this world is not enough. And this goes back to that, what I think in uh, Disidentifications, he talks about the utopian kernel that is present in all queer performance. And here we see he wrote a whole second book about that kernel of utopian meaning or hope or anticipation because queerness is the thing that informs us that the world is insufficient and needs to be changed. So queerness means, he says, a never-ending opening toward the potential in the world and also in ourselves. Uh, we can transform and the world can be transformed and we should never believe anyone who tells us the world can't be changed. Um, if, if, that, if someone's telling you that, that is false information. Um, queerness is moving endlessly toward what might be rather than what is. And therefore, queerness and its utopian force lies not in the what of Warner's question. It's not the point of getting the what, right? What do queers want? It's not about answering the what. It's about wanting. You could, you could ask, uh, what do queers want? Queers want pride parades. Okay, we got those. Uh, what do queers want? Queers want rainbow-colored um, sneakers. We got those. Okay, what do queers want? Queers want marriage. Well, we got that. Every time we get something, it ceases to be queer. <laughs> so the point is not in the getting, it's in the wanting. That queers want, and because we want, the world has to get bigger. And so, in other words, queer utopianism is not about getting to a place where things are finally perfect. It, in, in fact, this orientation embraces the paradox of the seemingly perfect, or the, of the impossibly perfect, perfectly impossible in which hoping for does not mean arriving at. It, the point is to continue hoping, not to get what you want and then shut down um, queer politics, which was something people were saying about gay marriage. Andrew Sullivan infamously wrote in a book called Virtually Normal in 1995 that we should, get, we should achieve marriage rights and military service rights and then shut down gay politics for good. I think Munoz would be exactly opposite of that in his orientation about you know no we need to want more things we need to keep figuring out how to want more than what the world is offering to us how do we do that he says art 
So, speaking of art, um, I am going to have you watch The Wizard of Oz, and I'm going to have you watch it, I don't know, maybe for the 20th time. I'm not sure how many times you've seen this. I've definitely seen this movie many times. And I'm going to have you thinking about the feeling for Utopia here and be thinking about questions like, what was new for you here? It's so valuable to go back to objects we think we know once we have more theory under our belts to see how they change. Because really it's our, our perception that creates an object. The object is not static, so you're gonna see new things in it every time because you're different. So what is new here for you in revisiting this film, particularly from queer and trans perspectives? And you will notice that queer graphic history references this film throughout so it begins and ends with the yellow brick road um which is why i had you i'm gonna have you look back at those pages so why is this film everywhere in queer culture why is it in our book why do you think queer people have loved this movie for nearly a century why was why did stonewall happen only several days after judy garland died um these are questions that <laughs> Uh, we can we can think a little bit about over on Blackboard together. Um, what is it about this film that seemingly is not about sexuality at all um, that has so captivated queer people for so long? Um, how does the film intersect with Munoz's definition of queerness as horizon and also as a concrete utopian practice? And then lastly, thinking about the characters a bit, we have these really interesting characters. They all need something. They all want something, right? And remember, Munoz is talking about the that queerness is about wanting. Um, what might these characters and, and the plot in general represent allegorically uh, in the context of queer meaning making or, or queer politics or culture? Um, so I hope you enjoy watching this. It's a gorgeous film. Um, and it's like queer 101 in terms of queer culture. You have to see this. So if you haven't seen it, you're welcome. Now you've seen it. Um, uh, and that's all I have for today. And I'm really sorry my camera cut out because this is our last video. Let me see if I can turn my camera back on. Hang on. I don't think I can. I think if I click that, my video, I'm, it's going to stop me. Um, so I'm, I'm really sorry that I can't um, record myself saying goodbye. But um, this is our last video. And I wanted to say, uh, I just really, really want to thank you for working with me all semester. I know this has been less than ideal. I really wish we could have spent more time together in person discussing these texts. Uh, but I'm so thankful that you all stuck with it. And um, I've been really impressed with your work and really glad that you took a course that, you know, has a reputation like this class. I hope that you were pleasantly surprised. Um, I might create a feedback discussion board for you just to like dump some thoughts in at the end of the semester since we can't see each other. But I just want to thank you for everything that you've produced and really say that I'm sorry this has happened and I hope you're doing okay. Okay. Um, I will not be back at GVSU next year. I'm going on sabbatical, so I will miss some of you um, who are graduating now or next year. So, um, yeah, uh, I'm just, I just miss you guys. Okay, I'll talk to you over on Blackboard. See you later.